Revelations chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and get those out. It'll be easier for you to keep up. We're going to be breaking these uh, verses down by phrases, so if you have your Bible, it'll be easier for you to keep up. Revelations chapter 2, verse 13 reads, I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, and you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. The phrase, I know your works and where you dwell, is not speaking of location, but rather that which is of a spiritual sense. The original word for dwell occurs 15 times in Revelation and always in an evil sense. Almost all commentaries dwell on the location of Pergamos and how evil it was. However, in, in fact, this particular church represents a time frame Then the city of Pergamos had little to do with the situation. Actually, all the cities of that day were evil. While some may have been more than others, all were wicked, as should be overly obvious. Christ, I think, through the church at Pergamos is addressing himself to the entirety of the church world that existed in the time frame of approximately A.D. 300 to A.D. 500. In this particular letter, we have a picture of the church that differs considerably from the two churches we have already discussed. The church of Ephesus had many good features, but was reprimanded for her falling away from its first love. The problem was bad enough that it was in danger of having its candlestick removed, meaning that it would cease to be light in a darkened world. Smyrna represented the church that was poor and depressed, yet rich in spiritual blessings. Pergamos is the exact op- opposite. It is accepted by the world, actually made the state religion. Consequently, untold thousands came into its confines who were unsaved and who remained unsaved. It left the word of God formulating its own direction. Hence, Jesus speaking of himself having the sharp sword with two edges, which symbolizes the word of God. It was the word that they had forsaken, and it was the word now that would judge them. And in fact, the Pergamos church was dwelling in a place of spiritual and spiritual compromise. The phrase, even where Satan's seat is. So we started out, I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is, doesn't refer to the city of Pergamos with its heathen temples, as some have claimed, but rather that Satan had joined the church, so to speak. Whenever the church is accepted by the world, something is wrong with the church. And to be sure, under Constantine, the church of that particular time was accepted. In fact, many of the clergy during that time were put on a state payroll. Christianity, which was what's hounded and hunted, had now been accepted. But in order to be accepted, it had to depart from the word of God, at least as a whole. Thankful some held true even as we will study, but the majority didn't. When we come to the final church, and I speak of Laodicea, we will find, I think, that that particular church that characterizes the last of the last days, in other words, the end of the church age, carries in some measure the characteristics of all churches. So if Satan had a seat in the Pergamos church, he definitely has a seat in the Laodicean church. The phrase, and you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith. So we started out, I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name 
and have not denied my faith proclaims the fact that despite Satan's effort and the vacillation of many believers, some were holding fast to Christ and as well to their faith. In Jewish history, and I speak of Old Testament times, a person's name was meant to signify their character, their demeanor, their courage, their personality, or lack of saying. The ideal is a mother, for it was a mother who normally did the naming, would name the child what she hoped it would be, or feared it might be. So one's name was meant to carry more than identification of that person. In keeping with custom, Mary named Jesus. However, she did so at the command of the angel Gabriel, Luke 1, 26 through 33. Jesus in the Greek means Savior. So in effect, what the Lord is saying here is that some of the believers still believed in the cross. They were placing their faith and trust in that finished work. My faith doesn't necessarily refer to an exhibition of faith, but rather all that pertains to biblical Christianity. It pertains to the cross and what Christ did there. Simple faith in Christ and what He did in giving of Himself as a sacrifice sums up Christianity. That's the story of the Bible, which is the story of redemption. Hence, it can be referred to as the faith, or as Christ labeled it, my faith. The pronoun mine, the pronoun my is used because it is all wrapped up in Christ. The phrase, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. The, so we started out, I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seed is. And you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. Signifies, as is obvious, that he was definitely one of those who fell into the category of holding fast the name and not denying the faith. He stands out because he was willing to give up his life for the name of Jesus and for his faith. To help the reader understand all of these things said as it regards these particular churches actually happened in that church and probably happened while John was in the prison. But yet these things signified something that would happen to the entirety of the church world at a, at a particular time in the future. As stated, the future for Pergamos, at least the time frame that is represented, was approximately between the years A.D. 300 and A.D. 500. So what happened locally was a precursor of what was going to happen to the testimony of the church at a later date. Verse 14 reads, But I have a few things against you, because you have there them who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. The phrase, but I have a few things against you, comes from one who is not guessing, but rather who knows. What does the Lord say presently about the modern church? What is his, he saying about me and you personally? To be sure if Christ says these things, and whatever they might be, the Holy Spirit is already saying them to our hearts and lives. In fact, Christ speaks exclusively through the Spirit. Jesus said, How be it, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, 
and shall show it unto you. John 16, 13, and 14. Many Christians would resort, retort by saying that the Holy Spirit is not speaking to them. However, He speaks in many and varied ways. Through God, preachers, through the Word of God, and through His own still, small voice. If it is to be noticed, even though Jesus condemns most of these churches in some way, He never allows the condemnation to stop the announcement. In other words, He then tells the church what is wrong and then how to fix it. What a wonderful Lord we serve. The phrase, because you have there them who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So we started out with the, but I have a few things against you because you have, the, you have there them who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication refers, I think, to spiritual unfaithfulness and apostasy from Christ. Isaiah 1.21 and Ezekiel 23.37 Most commentaries lead toward actual sexual immortality. Some feel that Christians at Pergamos were still practicing in the holiday festives and saw no wrong in indulging in the, in the harmless table in the temples and the sexual excitement everyone else was enjoying. But I find it hard to come to terms with the ideal that the church of that day or even a part of the church would place a seal of approval on fornication, even to the place and position of forming a doctrine after such gross immortality. Jesus used Balaam of old as an example. He was a hireling prophet in the employ of Balak, king of Moab. Balaam pur purposed to carry out the will of Balak, Balak, which was to curse Israel. Not succeeding in this, he continued to corrupt Israel by casting before them a stumbling block. Israel was beguiled into participation with unholy festives which but, which but Baal worshippers and this was followed by illicit relations with the daughters of Moab. It is my belief that Satan employed tactics to lure believers away from simple faith in the cross of Christ which is strongly hinted at in the previous verse, if faith is pulled from the cross to other things, and it doesn't really matter what the other things might be, spiritual failure will always be, be the result. Let's hear what Paul had to say. In the first four verses of Romans chapter 7, the Apostle uses a very telling il illustration. He uses an example, a woman who is married, but who divorces her husband, and without scriptural grounds, we might add, and marries another man. He said she shall be called an adulteress. He used this type of illustration to prove the following point. The Christian, in essence, is married to Christ. He is to look to Christ for everything. This means he's functioning under grace. If the believer then seeks to live this Christian life by adhering to law, he in effect as the woman of the our illustration becomes a spiritual adulterer. He is married to Christ, but he is as well having relationships with the law. If the Holy Spirit through Paul used such an illustration, then I think that Christ is in effect saying the same thing. Believers were being lured away from the cross. 
thereby lured away from grace, scumming to a doctrine of works, which every time will lead to spiritual failure. Christ was looking at these people as spiritual adulterers, and for the reason we have mentioned, and as well, much of the modern church regrettably falls into this same category. God cannot give victories to fallen man. He only gives them to His dearly beloved Son. If we attempt to overcome in any other manner, we fail because it's not God's way. The scripture plainly says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, Revelations 12 and 11, to be sure we overcome in no other way. What I have just said is one of the greatest truths that you the reader can ever absorb. Victory comes only through Christ and what Christ did at the cross. It's been that way from day one. Hence the example given to us in Genesis chapter 4 concerning Cain and Abel. Everything is in Christ as everything must be in Christ. But we must never forget it is in Christ according to what He did for us in the great sacrifice of Himself on the cross. This is the great sin of the church, leaving the cross, not some weird doctrine that sanctioned fornication, etc. And that concludes Revelations chapter 2, verses 13 and 14.